So, Dan, uh, let, let's start talking about your, your terrific book. So, a few years ago, now, you wrote a, a book called How We Invented Freedom and Why It Matters. A really interesting book about a quite unusual uh, tradition of, of liberty in Britain, rather different to other countries, which is m much longer and, and goes back quite a long way in our history, and the importance of that around the world and the influence that it's had. W what made you write that book? Now, I, I think the easiest thing in the world is to take things for granted and to become blasé you know, about what's familiar. But we are unbelievably privileged to live in an age and in a place where we have some mechanisms to hold the government to account and some notion of the elevation of the individual above the collective. It's almost impossible to stress just how weird this is in the long sweep of things. You know, maybe 10,000 years ago, somebody worked out that if you put a seed in the ground, crops will grow, right? It took about five minutes for somebody else to work out that it was easier to nick your neighbor's crop than to spend all year tending to your own. And then comes the really pernicious discovery that if you want to maximize the utility to yourself, you regularize the theft, right, through a series of tithes and tolls and taxes. So civilization was born in tyranny. And for most human beings, most of the last 10,000 years was the story of oppression and serfdom and caste and misery. And history was the story of the top 1% of the top 1%. The rest of us were, were scratching out a miserable existence dawn to dusk in the fields. And then comes this extraordinary breakthrough that happened more or less in the language that you and I are now talking. This idea that the rules are above the rulers, that the people in charge don't just get to make up the law as they go along, that, that above the king or the biggest guy in the tribe, there is this invisible but ineluctable force of a, uh, you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't taste it, but it, it binds the king as surely as it binds his poorest subject. And that, that beginning of the rule of law, which leads to property rights, which leads to uh, some independent magistracy to enforce those property rights, which then leads to uh, the development of you know, intellectual property and the beginning of, of uh, uh, innovative free market society, that was uh, first the property of English-speaking peoples and, and a handful of people in the nearby parts of Northwestern Europe, but then in the 20th century, it began to spread around most of the world. And it has, it, it has elevated and ennobled our species in a way that we just don't seem able to recognize. We must be the most uh, ungrateful generation ever to have lived. We've, we've, we've seen these extraordinary improvements in you know, literacy, longevity, freedom, you know, education, every possible metric. And yet, uh, we still complain about the system that is delivered. What made Britain so different? What, what happened here? We were beneficiaries of a lot of uh, happy accidents. Uh, one of the accidents was simply geography. If you're an island, you, you generally don't need a big land army to defend yourself. Uh, an island can be defended with a navy and a, a territorial militia, neither of which is a particularly good instrument for internal repression. So. In England and then Britain, unlike in most of Europe, when kings wanted things, when they wanted money or, or, or taxes from their, their subjects, they had to ask nicely by summoning a parliament. They couldn't compel by force of law in a way that some of the more autocratic states could do. The other thing which I think is, is an underrated miracle in, in the English-speaking world is the wonder of the common law. This system that you know, grows like a coral with each case serving as the starting point for the next. I mean, nobody would invent it. If you're trying to come up with a, a legal system from first principles, you would say, you write down the law, you make the general abstract principle, and then you apply it to a specific case. The idea that no one does that, that it just kind of grows organically, I mean, who would invent that, right? Where did it come from? We don't really know, right? It predates written history. But it, again and again, in the story of the English-speaking peoples, it has turned out to be the real hero, the, the force that has held uh, autocratic government at bay and preserved personal freedom. You talk about the, the English-speaking peoples, and you've written about the importance of the, sort of the Anglosphere of the, of the countries that sort of inherited this, this tradition out of, of Britain. Do you think that's still true today, that there's this uh, relationship around the world? I think in general, 
the countries that are beneficiaries of the limited government, common law, private property based uh, tradition that began in the Anglosphere are other things being equal are going to be better off than the ones that are not, right? So, so these, these values explain why Hong Kong is not China. You know, they explain why Singapore is not Indonesia. They explain why Bermuda is not Haiti, you know. And indeed, for that matter, they explain why, they explain why Israel is not Syria. We, we tend not to think of Israel as a former British colony, but it has the same property-based common law system and the same regulatory model as most of the, the core Anglosphere countries. So uh, that, that's not to say that you can't find counterexamples. It's just to make the point that in general, you know, if you, uh, in, in, with a kind of rules in veil of ignorance, if you didn't know where you were going to be born and you just had to make the choice, would I rather be born in a common law country, you would take it. Do you think people in Britain today still, still care about liberty? It's a, it's a very good question. I think people do care about liberty when it's easy. But at times of threat, that's when you stress test it. You know? And that's what alarms me about the debates we're currently having uh, during these lockdowns. An epidemic or a war or an earthquake or a disaster of any kind flicks switches in our brains. It, it makes us more authoritarian, more collectivist, more intolerant more tribal. It throws us back on our basic kind of hunter-gatherer heuristics. And just as the Second World War was then outlasted by a whole series of uh, government prohibitions that had been supposedly brought in contingently, but that then were not removed when the peace came. So I'm afraid that the same may happen as we come out of lockdown. So after 1945, the apparatus of state control that had been sold as part of mobilization, you know, in, in many cases remained in place for decades, arguably some of it even now. So we had, you know, we had rationing until 1954, we had ID cards until 1952, we had full conscription until 1960. But when you look at the economics of it, most of the controls put in, in place uh, in the first half of the 1940s weren't really removed until the Thatcher government in the 1980s. And, and in, in aspects of education and healthcare, we still have them. I'm afraid I can, I can see a similarly bleak future when I look at the world as it hauls itself out of the pupa of lockdown. It, it, we, we will also have been metamorphosed and not in a good way. You know, there, there will be a, a shift in power globally to more authoritarian countries, but the, the, much more alarmingly inside our heads there will be a, an authoritarian shift and you, you can see that already in the political debates in most countries. So do you think as a, as a free country we should have done things differently? I think you need a really good reason to take away people's freedom. Now that's a, that's a basic legal principle, right? You, you have a high threshold before you can arrest somebody, before you can incarcerate them, right? That went out of the window. And you now have this argument being made, how do you know that ending the lockdown won't lead to a, a, a resurgence of cases? Well, that is, that's cheating. You're, you're, you're reversing the burden of proof in a quite outrageous way, right? If you are proposing the most extraordinary assault on liberty and livelihood, something that we didn't even do during the Second World War, you know, restrictions that would have been unthinkable even in 1940, you know, the burden is on you to show that it is absolutely necessary. The burden is not on the defenders of the status quo ante to show that it isn't, right? We, uh, we, we seem completely to have lost our sense of, of proportion about that. And, and that, uh, that alarms me. And I think uh, a, a, a meaner, more authoritarian, poorer and more pinched future awaits on the other side of the lockdowns. Mm. Now, um, Brexit, of course, was supposed to be you know, a great opportunity for us to reassert our sovereignty and, and perhaps some of our liberal traditions as well. But, but now this pandemic has, has happened in the midst of the moment when we're sort of moving out into that. Uh, do you think, have we lost the, the moment to do that? Has the, some of the, the opportunities in Brexit been, been compromised by what's going on? Well, everything has been put in context by the, the vastness of what is now happening. So if you were to take you know, the most optimistic economic scenario, the rosiest scenario painted by the most cheerful lever, and compare it to the gloomiest scenario feared by the most scared Remainer, the difference between those two suddenly looks pretty trivial compared to what we are spending every week in terms of 
quantitative easing, furlough, and the, the associated costs of lockdown. So all of that has been, you know, in a sense, just overtaken by events. But if you still see Brexit as a long-term project, as a as a, a secular uh, reorientation away from a relatively declining part of the world economy and towards our as I see it, our more natural hinterland of, of markets across the oceans, then I think that will be vindicated over time. But frankly, you know, although the, the predictions of an immediate post-leave vote recession have been falsified, uh, it's going to be a long time before anyone can begin to look at the effects one way or the other of Brexit because, you know, we, we've suffered this awful blow of the coronavirus and the associated costs of the closures. I mean, you've already said that you're quite gloomy about what happens after lockdown. But are you optimistic about the, the, the longer term prospects of, of liberty in, in, in Britain? Or is it just sort of bad news for the foreseeable? Yeah, permanence is the illusion of every age, right? Um, we, the English speaking peoples have been dominant for so long that we tend to think of our values as universal values. You know, free speech, free assembly, jury trials, you know, uncensored newspapers, regular elections, equality between men and women, you know, habeas corpus. We, t we tend to think that those are somehow natural, right? That they are, the, they are the, the condition that any country will reach once it becomes rich enough and, and educated enough, right? Actually, it's really not true. Those precepts were overwhelmingly developed in the language that you and I are now talking. And you know, imagine, imagine that the Second World War had ended differently. Or imagine that the Cold War had ended differently. There'd have been nothing universal about those values then. Right? We, we owe our freedoms much more than we tend to acknowledge to a series of military victories by the English-speaking peoples against autocratic alternative systems. But nothing lasts forever. And it may be that as the the world slightly tilts on its axis, at least geopolitically, as, as power shifts from uh, Britain and, uh, and the United States to countries that have been less adversely affected over the past six months, we may be about to discover that what we thought or what we pretended were universal values turned out to be very much of a time and place. What does liberty mean to you and what, why does it matter? Just, you know. Liberty means the ability to do your own thing provided you don't infringe on the greater liberty of somebody else. It's that simple. And I would defend it both in utilitarian terms, that generally letting people find their own path to happiness is better than trying to second guess them, and in moral terms. I, I think there is a, a, a supreme moral value in people being allowed to find virtue in their own way rather than having it coerced. And as you say, we've inherited this really long tradition of sort of liberal values in Britain. And um, there's a sort of, do you think there's a responsibility that goes with that to make sure that we're maintaining that and then handing it on to the next generation as it's been handed on and handed on to get as far as us? And are we living up to that? We're incredibly lucky to have inherited what we have, to have lived, to have been born in this country at this time, you know. And what we have inherited is an extraordinary, gorgeous, complex tapestry that is far beyond the ability of any one generation to have sown on its own. Right? And that does imply a commensurate obligation on us to improve it and repair it and then hand it on securely to those who come after. Right? Our, our children are not just a random set of individuals born to a different random set of individuals. If you are born in this country or if you grow up in this country, regardless of where your grandparents were born, you become heir to that tradition. You have your, your little share of that tapestry. And with it comes your share of the obligation to, to have a sort of repairing lease on it, right? To make sure that, that, that we maintain it intact and that we improve it where possible. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes. So just, just one last one. O over the, um, the summer, we saw um, sort of attempts to problematize British history and to tear down statues of of various national heroes, even Winston Churchill at one point seemed to be in trouble. I mean, does that worry you? Is, is, that, is that a problem for a, a country that, that relies so much on this, this um, impressive heritage? What, what's worrying is not that you have a tiny handful of lunatics 
who think that it is somehow okay to attack the statue of Winston Churchill or Robert Peel or Abraham Lincoln. I mean, how absurd do you want to, you know, in the, in the US even attacking the statues of abolitionists and, you know, the, 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 every country has a lunatic fringe. You know, we, we don't get any special exemption there. The really alarming thing was the way in which official Britain humoured and indulged this lunatic fringe. The way in which politicians and police chiefs, universities, corporations, premier footballers dropped to their knees, often literally, in order to appease this, uh, these, these angry young blockheads. You know? And really, as a country, we deserve better. And the one thing that we should have inferred from the, the summer is all you need to expose the paucity of support that the statue smashers and iconoclasts have, all you need is a tiny modicum of patience. And it quickly emerges that there is, you know, there's almost no community where there is a majority uh, 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 for reviewing, let alone for taking down historical monuments. And uh, what I'd say to any university or town or company that's attacked in this way, just remember that you're dealing with a tiny unrepresentative. How did, how did Burke put it? You know, because uh, half a dozen crickets concealed beneath a fern make the field ring with their importunate chink while thousands of great British cattle chew the cud and are silent, pray do not imagine that those who make all the noise are the only inhabitants of the field.